We're getting to our last talk of um, State of the Map 2021. Um, we've got Dustin is here to answer your questions. So during the talk, make sure you answer questions um, and in the questions tab, and I'll ask them right away when we finish the talk. This is about using OSM for transport advocacy, um, using AB Street. I'm interested. I'm hoping there might even be some animations or some pictures. Um, so uh, let's get on with the talk. Hello, I'm Dustin Carlino, and this is a talk about using OpenStreetMap for transportation advocacy, um, using some software called AB Street. And uh, this is work that I've been doing with a, um, a number of other people, but particularly Michael Kirk and Ewan Lee. So uh, this talk is going to um, first just jump into a demo of how to use OpenStreetMap to argue for change in Seattle. Um, and then generalize a little bit and describe how you could use this in the place you live. Uh, and then conclude by talking about some of the hard problems with um, creating a, a detailed map model from OpenStreetMap. Um, so OpenStreetMap sort of tells you what the world is like today. Uh, this is an intersection in the U District in Seattle. And from OSM data, you can figure out where turn lanes are, um, where street parking is, traffic signals, things like that. And so um, the software AB Street lets you imagine how some of these things could be. It gives you an interface to, to edit roads and reallocate lanes, maybe for uh, buses or bikes. You can mess with traffic signal timing um, and also access restrictions to create things like low traffic neighborhoods. And in the future, we're also interested in uh, modifying land use to imagine what happens if you build um, higher density apartments or uh, multi-use development, including shops, um, and also reimagine uh, how bus routes can be modified to, to serve more people. So. Um, let me stop speaking in the abstract and just kind of show you uh, what, what all of this means. So um, this is the AB Street software running in uh, a section of Seattle near a park called the Arboretum. Um, and I'm just like simulating traffic really quickly uh, of, of a typical weekday just to get some interesting stuff going on. But I'm going to slow it down now and um, zoom in on uh, this, this road called Madison. And um, if we slow down even more, you can see uh, we have individual agents sort of um, moving through the space uh, and taking turns and trying to park and just a, a whole bunch of interactions happening here, um, all kind of built up from open OpenStreetMap data and other public data sources. Uh, but there's a particular problem in this area, um, something that both the sim simulation shows and something that um, I've encountered in real life, which is uh, if we find any trips with, uh, might speed up a little bit, if we find some trips with um, bikes trying to move along Madison, here we have one. Um, we can follow it and, uh, you know, things are nice and calm, but pretty quickly uh, there's going to be some uh, some amount of traffic starting to back up behind this car. Or sorry, uh, some some number of cars backing up behind this bike. Um, and as you can see from the, the lane data, there's not any, there's not too much room to pass. There's sort of a center turn lane um, and, and sometimes it's it's uh, there's or sometimes cars are able to use it. But, for example, the, the shoulder of the road is usually filled with parked cars. Um, and in reality, the, the cars are probably going to like overtake the bike. Um, and it, it's kind of an unpleasant experience uh, and, and pretty unsafe. And to kind of like further illustrate why, um, and open up a, a layer that kind of shows elevation gain. So uh, climbing this hill through through Madison, um, there's some pretty steep incline. Um, and also going the other way. Uh, and a, a more clear way of showing that is maybe this um, more typical contour map where like elevation is low here and here. But kind of right uh, in the middle, we we have this like really high point. So um, this leads to a lot of, of problems, uh, particularly in this section. And there, there's a lot of issues, uh, like sa safety issues, that I've encountered personally, and I've I've heard stories about. So I'm interested in fixing this. In particular, um, there there's a lot of traffic trying to move from uh, this neighborhood, sort of north, uh, up to the U District, and most of that traffic will take this road, um, Lake Washington Boulevard, and turn left. Uh, but there is another option. You might notice this this like pink area here. So this is a uh, private neighborhood called um, Broadmoor, and you're you're only allowed to uh, to enter this area and, and use the roads if you're a resident. But notice that it kind of has this like nice, very quiet shortcut that lets you like cut over to the the north end of the map. So I I, I want to know what would happen if uh, you know for some reason this this gated community would open up and let people walking and biking cut through. So I'm gonna go click the map to edit. Uh, uh, click access restrictions. And then if I zoom out, um, it sort of automatically highlighted this whole thing because uh, this is like one contiguous section in OSM that's marked 
uh, as access private. So I'm going to just allow uh, trips for, or I'm going to allow through traffic for walking and biking, apply the change, um, and then resume. I'm going to uh, run exactly the same traffic simulation with the same uh, trips, but now some of the pedestrians and the bikes will be able to to cut through this uh, this new shortcut that I've created. Um, so let's let's look at how that has changed. Um, one way to, to get a sense of like are more people using it like of, of course you can see uh, a lot of a lot more activity on this road but um, we also have a layer that kind of shows this uh, this this is just a map of what roads are being used the most but we can compare it to sort of a baseline um, of a simulation before these changes are made and you can see that um, this road is, is lighting up in red and uh, there's like a lot more traffic cutting through um, compared to before the simulation. And correspondingly, there's less people uh, taking Lake Washington Boulevard here because now they have this great shortcut. Um, so if we're lucky, uh, we can click on one of these individual people, uh, but we weren't lucky because they were already starting in the neighborhood and they were also starting in the neighborhood. Uh, demos are hard, sorry. Yeah, okay, well, if we, if we found a particular person um, that wasn't already starting through here, we could compare the route before and after and see individual uh, time savings. But we can also look at the aggregate measurement. So I'm gonna let this run, um, yeah, maybe at least until noon, then we can get some more data. So uh, this is actually a table that kind of shows, um, and actually we can probably find somebody here. Uh, like we have, um, yeah, maybe somebody uh, with a walking trip about seven minutes faster. Uh, but they're down there. Actually, yeah, sorry, never mind. So the point is, um, we can go look at aggregate patterns and see uh, how does this affect the, the travel time of people overall. Um, and it looks like it's it's about the same for a lot of people, but you'll notice there's a lot of green here. So um, let's actually deselect driving and only include people walking and biking. And then you'll notice that the, the time savings are very dramatic. So as trips get longer, uh, they gained, they, they, uh, they save a lot of time after this change. And that's because they're able to cut through the shortcut. Um, and then uh, the only like this is often something that um, like traffic engineers care about. You know, are, are trip times uh, better or worse? But you know, we also care about like risk exposure and, and safety. Um, that's kind of the, the whole motivation behind this. And so um, we have a few metrics to find, uh, and I don't have time to go into details. But in short, um, people are able to uh, to go through a lot less chaotic um, intersections with a lot less danger from being hit by a car uh, that are turning, and um, the. It's a little bit unclear what's happening here, but um, hopefully there's less cases of uh, vehicles needing to overtake cyclists quickly. So I believe uh, that's everything that I wanted to show here. So I'll assume you're convinced by that demo and want to try things out. Um, luckily, it's pretty easy to get started. Once you download AB Street and go to the uh, load map interface, there is a way to import a new map. It'll open up your browser and ask you uh, to draw a boundary using the geojson.io tool. And uh, here in the screenshot, you can see it downloading some data from GeoFabric, and it'll it'll do an import. Um, this this will take a few minutes, depending on like the size of the area that you're uh, you're bringing in. But here, it, um, this just imported like a section of Belize, uh, and I think the the end to end time was about thirty seconds because this uh, this area is small. But right, so if you're um, once you kind of initially play around, if you want to. Uh, use AB Street for, for anything more serious or for, for you know, lane tagging kind of permanently, the easiest thing to do is uh, get in touch and send me the boundary you drew in Ge GeoJSON. Uh, and I'll add this to the list of maps that are regularly imported so that it's easy to uh, update the data in when, when OSM changes. So after you do the import, probably the next thing you, you might want to do is get a traffic simulation running um, in order to explore some, some real changes in your area. And one thing you need for that is an idea of what trips people take on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and unfortunately, this data is kind of hard to come by and there's not really any standard formats for it. Um, and so if this is the direction you wanna go, I would encourage you to, uh, to get in touch. We can kind of discuss options um, for moving forward there. If you happen to be working anywhere in the United States or the United Kingdom, this is a lot easier because we have, uh, there's, like a, there's a nationwide data source that we can, we can use for this, but other places work well, or also work uh, with a little bit more, more effort. Um, and then after import, probably the main thing you wanna do um, given this audience is to uh, validate some of the OSM tagging visually. So particularly the, the lanes, uh, street parking, and if you're running the traffic simulation, you'll often notice vehicles get stuck in an area um, trying to do a completely ridiculous movement. And then suddenly you discover that there's a, like a, a turn restriction that's probably missing. Um, so uh, if you do buy into this ecosystem, you um, uh, what sort of things do you get? So everything that I've showed you works on um, any any des or any like native platform, and also most of this runs in your web browser without any download at all. Um, and there's a possibility in the future that we will work on mobile support. Um, of course, all of this work is open source, uh, 
and it's been under extremely active development for three years. This is my full-time job. Um, and we're always sort of looking to, to grow this community and, and uh, find ways for people to contribute. So whether that's through programming or helping with design, um, you know, how do we like physically represent uh, so much data visually and uh, yeah, communicate effectively to people? Um, or maybe you're, you like writing uh, documentation or kind of helping with project management or even just like blogging um, about issues in your area that you want to you want to see changed. Uh, and then, of course, you know, maybe you, you just want to um, maybe you can just help by uh, fixing up OSM data in your area to get the simulation running better. Um, and of course, you know, just improve the data quality generally. But um, if you if you sort of buy into this uh, AB Street ecosystem, you also get some other tools that aren't directly related to the traffic simulation. One of them is this tool that lets you explore what amenities are available within 15 minutes of a starting point. Um, and the 15 minutes could be walking. Um, you can account for elevation or change the speed or, you know, mark that you have an accessibility device. Uh, like the, the definition of 15 minute is, is a little bit flexible. But um, the view on the left shows you like from a single point, there are uh, so many commercial and public amenities available, like um, a post office and some uh, some fast food and stuff like that. And then uh, on the right is more of a view for uh, for planning. So this is all of the all of the houses that are um, able to reach some kind of medical facility within a 15 minute walk uh, and everywhere on the map that isn't highlighted um, is far away. And so maybe that's that's relevant from a planning perspective. Uh, and this is another another take on how transportation and land use are related. Um, this is an arcade game that we built last December where you play Santa and you deliver uh, presents to, to different houses and you have to refuel uh, once in a while from some kind of shop with food. Um, and so this is just a kind of a humorous take to, to get people to understand why it's nice to have, um, you know, lots of people living near near things where they can walk to it easily. So uh, another tool in the in the AB Street ecosystem is just a, a dedicated uh, viewer uh, for OpenStreetMap data. This just kind of shows you the rendering and lets you click on a, a particular road segment and just see the, the key values um, and quickly open up the, the IE editor there uh, to fix any issues you see. And so um, we've also experimented with like making an easier UI to tag some of the stuff that are, that's important to AB Street, particularly street parking. Um, and so th this is another idea that we could explore further if people are interested. Um, and so for this last part of the talk, I want to um, discuss some of the, th the things that AB Street infers incorrectly uh, from OpenStreetMap. And a lot of this kind of boils down to how uh, space is represented in OpenStreetMap. A road tends to be a center line with maybe an implied width from like the, the lane tagging, but uh, AB Street kind of needs to know a lot more physicality. So what kind of things go wrong? Um, here you can see a, a typical uh, set of one-way roads that are, um, yeah, like they're, they're mapped uh, separately because there's like a physical median in between. Um, and, you know, but, but in OSM, it's, it's, it's pretty reasonable. Uh, unfortunately, the AB Street import doesn't really get this right. So you can see that there are four independent traffic signals um, kind of in the middle and like the the four short road segments in the middle are also um, also there. And then this example is even more complicated because there happens to be a, a like cycle path um, that intersects like the north corner. So um, why is this a problem? Besides being sort of like visually inc incomprehensible, um, it makes it very difficult to understand the traffic signal timing. Like if you want to uh, model like a left turn um, here, you have to kind of like understand two or four different signals at the same time. Uh, versus just reasoning about it as, as one physical intersection like it like it really is. So another issue is um, in the simulation, vehicles will get stuck. So there are some rules to prevent them from starting a turn through an intersection that uh, that they can't finish. And whenever you have these like really short roads kind of in the middle of two intersections, this, this just kind of breaks down. Um, here's an example in Tempe, Arizona, uh, that is a bit of a problem. So um, you have a an east-west uh, divided highway, and there happens to be like a streetcar in the middle. And so the middle image shows the the native uh, or the naive import into AB Street, and as you can see, it's kind of broken. Um, but in reality, this is a pretty simple intersection. There just like happens to be a streetcar in the middle. Um, and so luckily, there are some algorithms that uh, AB Street has that will attempt to consolidate this intersection. It's very easy to detect like where where this problem happens. The the hard part is kind of fixing it up. Um, the, the hard part comes from producing the correct uh, intersection polygon that kind of covers all of the space and looks reasonable. And then also um, figuring out what movements are, are possible through this entire area, taking into account all of the turn restrictions that, you know, probably are expressed more in a more complicated way uh, in OSM, but have to be like mapped over to the simplified representation without, you know, while preserving everything. Um, 
But right, so sometimes that, that algorithm kind of works out, but then this image shows you a case where uh, it just like blows up terribly. And so, you know, the, there's more work needed. Um, and what I've been doing so far is trying to just improve the, the algorithm for um, fixing this up automatically from the existing data. But I've also um, definitely had my eye on the, the proposals over the years for mapping roads as areas and junctions as areas. Um, and even though these proposals haven't really gone through, I, I see a lot of people kind of like experimenting with, with mapping things anyway. And so I might start doing this for AB Street, trying to manually tag some complicated junctions and, and see what the import into AB Street could look like. Um, so if you're interested in, in this sort of uh, approach, definitely contact me. Um, so the next problem is uh, when certain um, things like uh, like a cycle track or a sidewalk is mapped as a separate way from the main road. Um, you know, th this is a fine schema uh, in OSM and like at the routing level, it, it kind of is, is easy to reason about. But um, of course, if you're trying to like render things physically and uh, edit the roads and edit the number of lanes on a road, this um, this kind of blows up. So on the right, you can see the AB Street representation um, and a lot of things are kind of wrong with it. The uh, for one thing, yeah, you, you can't like click on one of the roads and then see that there's like three or four lanes and kind of like switch the position of the cycle track or something like that because they, they are modeled as like two different roads. Um, and then the intersection near the traffic signal is, uh, is one of those double intersections um, that just kind of like makes it much more complicated. So ideally, um, like in, in AB Street, it's actually easier if things like cycle tracks and sidewalks are, uh, are mapped as an attribute of the road because then we can create the simple representation. But I, I totally understand the reasons for mapping them separately. So um, the approach that I've been trying so far is to is to sort of fix this up on the AB Street side and like snap the cycle path to the to the road and like simplify the representation there. Um, but this get, this gets very complicated. So like here the cycle track uh, crosses like a, a slip lane for vehicles turning right, um, and then yes, like snapping in these cases and and preserving everything is is pretty tough, uh, and it's it's ongoing work. So the I guess the last issue is, is sort of related to all of this, but a little bit simpler. Um, whenever you have a like a divided one-way road, uh, AB Street tries to infer the the width of every road based on the like the lane count, and um, you know sometimes it gets this right, but like in cases where uh, the like the center line of these two one ways gets pretty close, like maybe physically the you know the satellite imagery is a little bit off or the the width of the road changes, but um, like towards the the south end of the picture in AB Street, you can see the roads just smush together um, unrealistically. So this is a little bit tough to work through. Uh, anyway, so that's that's the talk. Thank you so much. Um, you can try out the software and uh, learn more at abstreet.org. Uh, please email me if you want to talk about any of this, and I'm also on the OSMUS Slack. Thank you so much. Bye. So, um, really interesting talk. There was doesn't I think you saw in the chat. There's lots of appreciation for your talk and interest. With, people saying they uh, won't be able to type all their questions out fast enough. So, um, yeah, and I think my, my internet connection is struggling at the moment, um, but uh, I think we'll go with this. So I'm going to try and go with these with the most voted questions uh, first. So in the simulation, um, how do you decide which agents want to go where? Uh, sorry, there's a little bit of lag. Which agents go where? Um, so this comes from a data source outside of OpenStreetMap, uh, and it depends on the region. In Seattle, um, luckily, there's a public agency that does a bunch of modeling uh, of census data and land use and vehicle counts and a bunch of other stuff, and they actually have a like a disaggregated data set describing like three or four million trips around the King County area daily. Um, and we just kind of like blindly import that and trust that. Uh, in other areas, we have to do a bit more work to generate this travel demand data. Um, in the UK, luckily, there's uh, some 2014 data showing like how many people live and work in different regions. Um, and in the US, we at least know how many people live in a certain place, but there's not like a, a single easy answer for this. Right, yeah, I guess that's where you said um, the it's easier in the US and UK to get that data. Um, so uh, what kind of OSM tags on the roads are the most important for this simulation? Um, I would say the most important things is getting the lane tagging correct. And the thing that's always missing is street parking. Um, even if you have you know, your turn lanes and the number of lanes I'm missing. And so then inferring the proper width of the road is really hard. Um, and I guess the other mistake that I see a lot is um, 
when ways are split, sometimes the, especially like if you, if you take a, a two-way road and split it into a dual carriageway, a lot of times uh, it's easy to forget to update the lane count on either side. Um, but whenever you visualize it geometrically, it's, it's really easy to see the, the count is too high. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess this is the street map struggle of it's um, kind of expanding and growing more detail. So I know I've not done a lot of lane counts on the data I map, but um, people are getting there and we're slowly adding that more tagging, aren't we? Um, so about this for people using this, um, which organizations are currently using this? Um, and how much are you trying to get other campaigners or councils to benefit from the, the tool? Yeah, so uh, right now, no, nobody is using it, um, which is quite unfortunate after uh, all of this work. And I'm trying to, to change that. But the problem is I'm kind of a programmer. I can, like, on a good day, write technical documentation. Um, but, like, convincing people to, to adopt this tool and to use it for, um, like, engaging communities and planning and stuff like that, like, I've... I've tried that uh, and it hasn't gone well so far. So if you know somebody who's, who's good at that, uh, please put me in touch. Yeah, um, hopefully we can help with that or some people there. Uh, the exciting, I can definitely see the benefit of, it'd be good to have people campaigning for that. Um, and I think you answered this one briefly in the chat, but I'll ask it for the benefit of the video. Um, what did you, uh, what, not what, where did you get the elevation data from? Yeah, the elevation data um, in the demo comes from King County LIDAR around the Seattle area. Um, but the for other for other maps that you import in AV, um, which has lower resolution, resolution but covers the world. Uh, and all of this is actually through a, a separate Python library that um, a friend of mine wrote uh, called Elevation Lookups. And um, if you have elevation data for another place, either in vector or raster format, it's library. So take a look. Yeah, great. I was going to ask that. Um, okay, so um, how do you estimate or set the number of cars, cyclists, and pedestrians? So I think does that go back to the the kind of data you you were able to get? Yeah, that's that, that's basically the travel demand question. Um, the short answer is like AB Street doesn't really try to figure this out. We take in data from another source, um, and sometimes like we're also the people kind of processing that data to to guess the number of trips, but like this is not really my my area, honestly. Yeah. Um, cool. So uh, so then, OK, maybe it's not your area, but there's the question that leads to this. Uh, how accurate is the simulation to real life data and scenarios? And and really good part of this, how do you assess how accurate it is? Yeah, that's um extremely hard problem to like calibrate the simulation to reality. Like, first of all, you would need um, vehicle counts uh, and also like bicycle and pedestrian counts at certain roads at different times of day. And you, you can compare that to the simulation. Um, I haven't started doing that because I don't expect it to be uh, super realistic. A lot of times the demand models are just like very out of date. Right. Like realism issues in the simulation itself that like I, I know about. So until a lot of those are fixed, I'm not sure it's worth trying to to calibrate when the answer is probably um, not good. But like, I think um, very like trustworthy quantitative results in order to use this for advocacy, like you can still demonstrate problems uh, in a really visual way and get people's feedback about like what you want to change. Yeah, and I guess that would happen if, um, go back to people using it, organizations, if, if you manage to get a change implemented, then that's how you can actually see whether it's accurate or not. If well, there's always other conditions, but does your change reflect what you predicted um, or not? Um, so I've asked that one. Um, so parking lanes, which you seem very interested in, does AB Street somehow detect separately mapped parking lanes, separately mapped cycleways, and sidewalks? Um, I'm not sure I've seen separately marked uh, parking lanes unless, except there was a new proposal for something called like street side parking recently that I haven't I haven't looked at to, to try to import it. So the answer there is no. Um, if there's some area that has a lot of this, uh, send it over and I can take a look. Um, and part of the talk kind of mentioned the like separately mapped. And so, so cycle paths will uh, get imported if they're separate, but as you um, saw in the in the uh, presentation, they kind of blow up. Um, 
And so like I need a really robust snapping algorithm to kind of like associate it with the, the main road whenever it exists. Um, and because this problem is so hard, I'm not even attempting sidewalks yet. Um, right now, uh, unless the road has like sidewalk left, right, both, then um, like we're, we're just inferring sidewalks, uh, making kind of a blind guess. Yeah, um, so uh, that's it on the questions that have been asked there, but there's, uh, yeah, lots of, lots of conversation and chat going on there. Um, I'll encourage you, Dustin, to um, go over to the post talk chat room. Um, and if anyone wants to chat more with Dustin, uh, as you said, you've got lots of things to ask. Uh, it might be easier if uh, using our platform, you can chat there to him yourself and see how your conversations flow. Um, thank you very much, Dustin, for that. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Um, okay, I'll, I'll go to the other room now. Yeah, and so um, we're now that.